Right. Welcome once again to the tower. The talk we're about to have is Optimizing Boot Time by Margarita Manterola. And once again, the IRC channel for questions is hash DC6 hyphen talks hyphen tower. Thank you very much. Marga. Okay. Uh, this is above, not a talk, so it's not intended for me to come here and give you the magical solution. I'm going to present some research I've made, some suggestions and, and things that I've found, and uh, I'd like you afterwards to also propose ideas and, and present experiences that you've all had regarding uh, boot speed. Uh, mainly, it's a question of usability. Uh, since you are here with your laptops, you probably boot your machine quite often and you probably complain of how slow it boots because most uh, laptops tend to take about a minute in boot time and that minute seems like a very long time when you are eager to start working and you have to wait for the whole booting sequence to come up. So uh, that's why we want to make it better. But we are not that bad. These are the times that I took. Uh, they were all done in the same computer in uh, Pentium 3. Uh, so all these are freshly installed distributions. Well, actually, the Edge installer was not working really, really well that day, so I had to manually install the desktop task because the desktop task was not there. But that's the only thing that I manually did. And uh, the Chen 2, I did not install myself because I'm not capable of installing it myself. <laughs> but uh, I asked a very good friend of mine to install it in the same machine, and it was a freshly installed Chen 2, whatever that is. So. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, of the freshly installed distributions, Edge is the one that's doing better. So we are not that bad. <laughs> uh, from Edge to Search, there's very little difference. It's, there hasn't been much of change. Uh, this is, of course, with XIM4 working properly. If for some reason, when the network comes up, uh, the interface is not configured. XIM takes like one whole minute to time out. But, well, this was with XIM working properly, so we didn't have that problem. Uh, uh, it looks like the Ubuntu people made a lot of progress between Breezy and Dapper, but we are still doing better. And, well, with Chen2, it's, Chen2 is twice here because Shentu has a nice configuration file, something like etcrc.conf or something like that, where you can configure how the boot process is going to work. So freshly installed Shentu was kind of slow, but after changing something like three variables in the config file, we got a very fast boot for Shentu. Uh, that's one of the nice things that, uh, of that distribution, that you can just touch three variables and change the boot process completely. It's like more than 20 seconds of the difference just changing three variables in a configuration file. When you compared the startup times, did you also compare to what services were being started by default or were, that were installed uh, by default on the different uh, distributions? Because if one has an SQL server by default uh, and the other does not, that will impact boot times. So did you look at that? Yeah, sort of. Uh, it's mainly freshly installed and I was aiming to a desktop distribution. So uh, uh, Dapper and, 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 and Edge installed almost the same services. And with Gen2, we installed only the desktop part. So it's they, there might be a little bit more services than others, 
but uh, it's mainly the same thing because it's a de desktop installation. It does not have Apache or SQL Server or anything like that. Well, and well, up there it's what I've been doing, tweaking the installation of Edge so that it booted faster. I got it to boot 20 seconds faster. Uh, when the boot time is 60 seconds, 20 seconds is a big difference. But it still is a lot of time. 37 seconds is a lot of time. Uh, we should aim to get it as, as fast as possible, like lower than 30 seconds. Uh, we are competing against an, an operating system that boots in something like 10 seconds. So we really want to make this as fast as possible. So. Of course, all that I did, I did it with boot chart. See, I, I didn't time the time of the distributions with a clock. I did all this with a boot chart. So this is the boot chart of freshly installed Edge. Do you want the mic? Uh, Boots in 10 seconds? Uh, Windows XP. I, I don't think so. Uh, yes, it booted in my laptop when I bought it, it booted in 10 seconds. Okay. Okay. It usually loads the graphic interface, but still loading all the services in the background. So yes, it doesn't really load in 10 seconds. I know, I know, I know, of course, of course, of course. I'm talking about the user point of view. I know, I know it's crap. I'm not saying it's a good operating system. It's just that from the user point of view, you have an interface in 10 seconds. Well, uh, we try this uh, with School Linux and the thing is you have to be logged in. That's the ACID test. You have to be ready to start a program as a user. Then you can say you have to put everything ready. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Well, this, this is up to GDM Greeter. It's not logged in. If you count the time that GNOME takes to start, it's even more time. I'm just waiting until GDM Greeter runs. And that, that's the point, point here. If the measurement, the, measure, the method you use to measure this gets you into this, this kind of discussion, you should probably find a point where you really started uh, just arguing with you a little, that you just are starting a program as a user. Thank you. OK, yes, but well, I was concentrating on boot time. I also think Genome should try to start quickly. Yes, they, they are trying to work on that. Okay, so what's the, what takes the time away? This graph, for if there are some people that haven't seen boot chart yet, uh, the blue thing is the CPU use, the pink thing here is waiting for the hard drive and this is reading or the, of the hard drive or something like that. So we mainly don't want these kind of things where the CPU is not being used, the hard drive is not being read, or, well, here or here. And here we have very little CPU and a lot of hard drive. So this is hardware clock being synchronized. All the distributions have this problem. Hardware clock takes around two seconds to synchronize. And if you don't run it in background, it's whole two seconds of nothing going on. This is depth mode. It's reading the whole module list and stuff. It's about three seconds. This is network coming up. This is waiting for the DHCP server to give you an IP. And afterwards, running port map. As you can see around here, there are two slips. There's one slip one in the DHCP script and another slip one in the port map script. These slips are there so that services can be uh, set up after the interface has come up or after port mod has finished running. And you might think that one slip one is not that bad because it's only waiting for one second. But if we have one slip one here, one slip one here, and uh, there's like another slip here, although it's not in shellcode. 
uh, it starts to add up a lot of seconds of doing nothing. So we don't want our CPU to sleep at all. <laughs> and well, finally, GDM takes a lot of time. Like this place here is this place here, and it's doing nothing, but it's inside GDM. It's not in a shell script. It has a sleep one, but hard coded inside GDM, so uh, it's, it can't be touched from a shell script. So, what I did to make it boot faster, here's the boot chart for when it booted in 37 seconds, was first start the network in the background so we don't have that hole here, then remove that mode from the boot process because we only need to run that mode when we change the kernel, so why run it every time the machine boots? Okay, I know for a server, I know that a server only reboots when the kernel changes, but that's not the point, not, that's not the fact for a desktop. What would happen if you um, put depth mod in the background? What would happen if you were to put depth mod, instead of removing it, put it in the background just like you did with the network? I didn't try it. Uh, I think it would work okay. Does anyone think that it wouldn't work? I just take it, took it away because I think it was useless. Why run that mode every time your machine boots? If you only need to run it once when your kernel changes. It's like such a waste of CPU and of disk reading. So I took it away because I, I, I was bothered. But it would probably run okay if you put it in the background. Uh, then running hardware clock in the background took six seconds away. Uh, the boot chart showed three seconds of, of uh, gap, but it took six seconds away to run it in the background. Uh, I'm not sure if running hardware clock in the background uh, is damaging. <laughs> in the test I've done, I didn't find it damaging, but I'm not completely sure. So if you think there's a problem with running in the background, please say so. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to pass this on from IRC. Um, Somebody has just said putting depth mod in the background won't work. You need it completed for loading modules, but yes, removing it makes sense. So I'm just passing that on. Okay. Running hardware clock in the background is probably not a problem because it only the reason it takes so long is because it wants to properly sync or read the time at the moment it gets updated. But the only thing you have is that you might have a slightly less accurate time in the, during the boot process, but that should not be an issue. Def and surely if you run stuff like NTP, it probably gets synced properly afterwards anyway. So that's probably, a, you could, I think you could even just leave it out. You, uh, you could patch hardware clock to not try to do syncing and just read the time and then you might be one or two seconds off, but that will get corrected later anyway. Okay, so it's not damaging. Okay. Uh, then, this I found on a user list, um, searching for something like Debian, boot time, or something like that. I found a mail that say, point your shell to bin dash instead of bin bash, and it took six seconds away. This is the most trivial change I made. I used update alternatives, it was one command line, then pressing one button. And, and it took six seconds away. I think that this is a change that should be made either by making dash the default SH or by making the init script use dash explicitly, but one of the two has to be done because it's such a waste of time not to do it. Uh, well then, uh, using parallel starting for the services at the same run level, this is actually mangling with etc init the RC, which actually has parallelized uh, starting of the services already there. Uh, it's just a variable that has to be changed. <laughs> I didn't know it either. I started looking at the file 
to see what I had to change to make it start parallelized, and I realized there was a variable there that actually did the job. It's just changing the value, and it works. Uh, well, it took only two seconds away, but then rearranging the services so that things start in a different order, and especially this, this hole over here was the GDM sleeping, right? So I rearranged the services so that when GDM is sleeping, uh, DBus is doing something. I don't know exactly what, but DBus is taking the CPU. So it took other two seconds away, okay? So, uh, uh, what I've been saying, uh, the problems that we need or may be able to solve, to parallelize, to, to start the services in parallel, we need to know what has to be started first and what has to be started second. I, dis I did this by hand, tweaking things, changing them from the 20 to 15 and whatever, but it was like a very dirty thing to do. I only did it to try to boot as fast as possible, but to do it clean, neatly, we would need to uh, know exactly what needs to be started before whatever else needs to start. So uh, this needs kind of a lot of work to show the dependencies of each script. This is what Chentu does currently. Uh, it, it does it at runtime. And doing it at runtime probably wastes CPU time because it calculates the dependencies whenever the a script, an init script needs to run, it calculates the dependencies, sees if the dependencies are already started, and if they are started, it starts, and if they are not, it starts it. Uh, this works okay, gen boot quite fast, but uh, it would be faster if the dependencies were hard-coded. If we had a command like update boot dependencies or whatever that hard-coded the dependencies so that it started in the correct order. Yes, Nati. Okay, passing on another few messages from IRC. Um, firstly, boot script reordering could be done based on dependency info using INS serve. Secondly, um, the parallel booting can be enabled in etc. default RCS, but the parallel sorry, yeah, but the parallel boot system needs more testing before it can be made the default. Um, this is from the person who wrote the parallel boot feature. Okay, uh, okay. So historically, there have been problems with things like where in the sequence you start NTP based on the fact that people have very different ideas about what they're using their computer for and what's important and what's not. As we go through thinking about this and thinking about how to maybe make this stuff configurable, is anyone thinking about that notion that you know, some people, th that we might need some concept of a, of a usage profile mapped into this as well? I mean, the, the specific example of the time synchronization stuff, some people want that started very early because they don't want any log entries on the system that uh, don't have the right timestamps, and as a result, they're willing to push the network start stuff also very early. On the other hand, with a notebook or something, the right assumption is no networking until very late in the process and you do dynamic device discovery and so forth. These things create interesting trade-offs and sometimes even loops in the boot script dependencies? Yes, well, if we had uh, the second point here, a configuration file where you could specify your boot process, it could be a nice feature to specify what priority network has or what priority, whatever other things that we want to have priority have so that the, the Yes, so that they are started earlier. Regarding NTP, when I was testing Breezy, my network was kind of clogged because I was downloading like three DVDs from previous DevConf um, um, for installing Fedora that I didn't have time to install it, but anyway. Uh, so the network was clogged, so NTP couldn't reach the server, and uh, that like added like 20 seconds 
to the boot process because NTP was running in foreground and uh, it, 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 until it timed out after 20 seconds, the, the boot process didn't go on. So that's the kind of bugs that we don't want. Uh, then I tested Breezy without, uh, with, with the network not clogged. The number I presented earlier was with the network working all right. Yes, Nati. Sorry, this is actually just an aside from, um, from IRC yet again, saying, could people in the audience when they're speaking please introduce themselves? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, it, it would be nice to have script dependencies. Uh, that Someone from IRC said that it can be done. Uh, I didn't understand exactly how, but it's good if it can be done. Uh, and it would be really, really nice to have a file where we can specify what kind of boot process we want. Um, oops. <laughs> and finally, uh, the boot process is really very verbose. It shows up a lot of info. And when you're running it in parallel, the info <laughs> is like so much garbage because all the scripts are outputting the same uh, to the same place at the same time, and it's like, it's useless. So it would be nice if that could be selected or configured, like passing uh, an option when it starts that says verbose, yes, or either configuring it in the same configure file, whatever, but so that it's not so verbose, it's easier, easier to understand, easier to see, is if something is working or not, and maybe not outputting so much might reduce a second or two. I'm not sure, but uh, when you when you untar something and you use the minus b option, you know that you are taking such a lot lot more time because you are outputting things. Uh, so I think it might reduce a second or two, not to have so much output. Um, uh, on another si side note, people on embedded systems also um, disable the um, kernel message output and almost all of the boot output and they gained um, multiple seconds, I think at least. Uh, three or four or so on a slow ARM system just by not doing anything of kernel output. Um, I'm Peter de Schrijver from Belgium, P2 at Debian.org. <laughs> uh, okay, so probably not outputting things makes thing, things faster too. Uh, so, well, main, mainly this was what I was proposing. Uh, Going back to the previous slide, is there any objection to making dash the default SH shell? Um, it's a great idea in practice. The problem is that you will occasionally run into bugs with people who assumed it was bash. So you're just, ask, you're just um, making it a little bit worse if such a bug happens. Which bugs? Fascisms, you know, of any kind. Um, just there's all there's all different kinds. Um, I run with with uh, Dash, and I see maybe one a month or something. It's not a big deal. Andrew McMillan, uh, um, wouldn't that just mean that the bugs would get filed against those scripts? <laughs> that might be a good thing. Okay, so uh, to whoever has the power of doing this, I would really want to ask to have SH pointed to Dash. Yes. Sorry, again with the ILC. One, pers one person comments, um, init.d dependencies can be specified using LSB format and the reordering can be done using the INS serve package, using the info to reorder the scripts and it is possible to, ri to run init.d scripts in parallel using serialized output from the, using the start part option. Another person says, <laughs> yes, um, bashisms are already RC bugs, which means most of them have already been fixed, so.
about uh, the dash uh, change. Uh, maybe it would be a bit less risky of breaking different things to em simply have the init scripts that are critical for booting have hash bang bin dash at the top, then it's very clear whatever interpreter you use and you can use dash for specifically that init script and not for anything else. And uh, of course that needs to have then a dependency on dash, but well, we need to do that anyway. Um, I'm Matt Duck. Um This is basically what I was going to raise. If we have dash as the default for init scripts, we do need to add it to the base system, which is something we just want, might want to consider because if we keep adding stuff to the base system, we are effectively increasing the size of our minimal system, which used to be 30 megabytes and is now well above 100. So, Okay, uh, does anyone who has a computer can tell me how much dash takes? 160 kilobytes. Could we actually get rid of bash? This is Bdale. <laughs> I mean, look, if you're going to change the default, it's ludicrous to ship more than one shell in base essential, right? So, you know, if there's one that's faster and smaller, then that kind of like feels reasonable for base. I mean, I'm, I'm not a bash basher. I actually like bash, but let's be reasonable. Um, the problem that we have with that right now is that we've allowed people who have bashisms in their programs to just add a dependent to uh, make the hash bang line say bin bash. So um, there's lots of scripts out there that do just use bash and they don't even declare dependency on it because it's an essential. So <laughs> it would be a lot of work to move away from using it, I think. Yeah, if you're going to move to it, you certainly are talking about, you know, a policy change in that regard because I don't think you could tolerate that, at least for init scripts and stuff like that, whether it would still be reasonable to invoke bash from, you know, post net scripts and things like that, whether it would have to be added as a dependency. It's not a trivial change, but if we're talking about making changes you know, to what's going to be used by the init scripts, and that's going to lead us to think that having two shells and base is reasonable, then I'm not sure we've finished solving the problem yet. Okay, so maybe the solution for edge, so that we don't make edge lag, would be to file bugs to whichever init script is there that can work with Dash and ask nicely that this init script run, run with Dash. I will note that that a lot of us who work on embedded have used ash for exactly this reason. This is also a much smaller footprint and, and it's um, you know, appreciated by that as well. So um, lots of people like, like ash as opposed to bash for this sort of basic stuff. Okay, uh, I'm not such a shell expert. I don't know the difference between ash and dash. In practice, it, it did not cause us much trouble to to make our scripts work under ash as opposed to bash. Yes, it's not exactly the same, but neither was it a big hassle to, to build, build familiar to use ash instead of bash. Um, I'm Jim Geddes. Um, I work on the uh, handhelds project and am currently still worried about keeping things small, though not as small, on the One Laptop for Child project. Okay, <clears throat> another, Maria, another qu uh, remark would be that uh, it, it definitely helps to use as small binaries as possible for getting, for booting faster. So you could even think of using BusyBox for all the init D stuff, if possible. And the second thing you could do is uh, minimize the amount of forking done, done in scripts. So don't use pipes when you don't really need them, but try to use as much of the options of the single command you, you use in the script. That helps a lot as well. Saves multiple seconds, all these tricks together. Uh, Peter Reinholds comments that um, Debian Edu has been using Dash as shell for several years already, and it's not a big problem. Uh, well, I have one more question about where to place the uh, login <laughs> story. <laughs> Is it possible to move that even earlier to, to give the user a kind of good feeling? It is supposed to be possible. I tried, I moved GDM very up the scale of the numbers. I don't remember exactly which number I gave it. But I put it very, very up, the upper I could give it. 
and it still came up last. Uh, but it's supposed to be possible. Uh, if you put it early, it is supposed to come up early. But it takes such a long time that it comes up last, last anyway. Uh, I'm Blars. Uh, not using GDM may be a way to significantly <laughs> speed up your boot. You now, even if you do have to start X after you log in that way, uh, I, f I don't like any GDM or any of those. I don't use them. Well, yes, of course. Uh, but I was aiming to the, uh, whatever, the user interface, the user installation. And users tend to like GDM or KDM, but I like GNOME, so I stuck <laughs> with GNOME. Yeah, just a really quick uh, comment on the Ash Dash Bash controversy. Um, so actually, currently in Debian, Ash uh, pre-depends on Bash. So there's, uh, or, sorry, on Dash. Ash pre-depends <laughs> on Dash. So uh, there's really no point in using Ash instead of Dash. Yeah, but it, you just get an extra 16K instead of uh, just having the whatever 93K it is installed. Okay. Uh, Guki? Uh, I'm Wookie. Um, yeah, I was just going to follow up really on other embedded people who've, who've mentioned all, the, all this stuff applies to small systems particularly. We tend to really care. We'd like boot seconds of two seconds, boot times of two seconds rather than 35. Um, <laughs> obviously that involves taking stuff out, but there's as a lot of people who've looked at, uh, P2 mentioned a couple of things, there's a lot of things we can do. You can, there's kernel patches to make things boot faster and um, uh, obvi obvious stuff like changing the shell, but there's a whole load of research being done on how to make things boot as fast as possible. And not all of that is applicable to desktop systems as well, but some of it will be. So if someone gets really enthused, there is uh, quite a lot of research being done and we could try and see how much of that we can use on general systems. And the embedded people will be terribly keen to see essential reduced as much as possible and all these sorts of things are, are generally great. So uh, tick VG. All we have to do now is make it happen. Yes, exactly. How do we, we make it happen? How do we get uh, whatever knowledge you have to the user system? There isn't a simple answer to that question, obviously. Um, I mean, what I would say is, if someone's interested in this, then, um, I went to a talk about reducing boot time aimed at embedded systems, and so anyone who was looking at this should read that document because it had loads of useful points. Um, that would be a good start. Um, I suppose we need to have a, a team or something, really, is, is the only way to get it done because it, does, it crosses all aspects of the system. So you've got to have people who know about this, that, and the other and know whether changing something is going to break a whole lot of other things and who's going to complain. And as someone else pointed out, there is a genuine problem of what is your target system? Is this a server, a laptop, or a tiny box? Uh, and they don't have the same requirements. So um, we want to make as much possible as possible because we are supposed to be the universal Oz. And Debian has so far had very much a kind of desktop and server focus and has largely ignored smaller machines. And obviously, we're keen to get as much stuff suitable for smaller machines in that doesn't break everybody else's systems as possible. The uh, website of the CE Linux forum has a lot of tips which are, which are mo mostly geared towards embedded systems, but some of them should be applicable to, and some of them are actually already implemented, so that proves they are applicable <laughs> to desktop systems. Uh, if, if for the people who want to look, it's like, I think it's www.celinuxforum.org, and it's a wiki page, and there must be a, a link on boot time optimizations and then you get the whole list and some have been implemented and some have hints on how much how much time you could save by you implementing those. Um, Peter Reinholds in comments on IRC that six Google Summer of Code projects proposed to work on the boot system speed. Hi, I'm Ryan Murray, the GDM maintainer, and I'd just like to say that the sleep that you are seeing is actually GDM waiting for the X server to be ready to use. GDM tries to talk to X when it fails, 
It then sleeps and tries again and again and again. So it's actually waiting for X to come up here and the sleeps, uh, there was one in earlier versions, but in the current version in unstable on testing, the sleeps have been removed from sort of the standard process. So the only time it's sleeping is if X has not come up yet. So anyone wanting to look into that part of reducing that time, look at X, not at GDM, because it's just waiting for X. Okay, uh, just uh, comment to the previous comment. Uh, I had to say something and I forgot what it was. Uh, which was the previous comment? Ah, Summer of Code, right. Uh, it's great that there's a Summer of Code issues and, and, and people wishing to work on that, but I think that this needs to be much more than just Summer of Code. That every person that has an init script in the boot process has to be involved not only four or five students working and trying to earn some money during this summer. Yeah, um, Igor Smahinos also comments that two of these six projects have a very good chance of being accepted. It's great. It, I just want to have the whole Debian maintainers with the boot scripts uh, also involved, not, not only the summer of code. There was a comment over there. No, uh, I'm just too, too, too stupid. Um, yeah, a few comments to uh, several things that were mentioned here. Um, for example, uh, the, the fact that Ash pre-depends on Dash is uh, because we have no Ash anymore and it's just a dummy package. So, that's, uh, so we don't have any choice there anyway. Um, and on the thing that uh, scripts should use Dash explicitly, I think that's a, actually a bad idea um, because if you ever change the default shell again, you will have much, much more trouble. Um, so I think we should go for the clean solution here and uh, just change the base system. Uh, obviously that needs uh, one release cycle to, re uh, to really apply and I think, don't think it would actually make it for Edge, but maybe that's just me being pessimistic. Um, so um, the, I think the, the uh, more important problem on, uh, by, uh, of changing the default shell and kicking bash out of essential is um, the whole um, build thing because many, um, I think most of the this actual installed system is uh, very bash, uh, bash clean so, uh, so that you can't use dash instead but uh, I think uh, many of the Debian rules files and stuff like that, they s still use bashisms. And um, if you kick bash out of the essential, you will have many uh, failures um, on build time. So you need to uh, give, um, give you some time to f fix all these failures. Yeah. Uh, Clifford Bashir from Linspire. Um, the GDM maintainer has a good point. X takes a long time to start, even after you get past the desktop on either GNOME or KDE or past the login screen, you have another 15 to 20 seconds before you get a desktop. And as long as we have Keith Packard and Jim Geddes in the back, <coughs> maybe they could tell us if they have done any research into optimizing the start of X, because I've heard rumors that there are things you can do. Actually, I had, I had two comments I can certainly answer that question. Um, the reason X takes a long time to start up is not X, it's the desktop environment. Uh, if you look at what, GD, what GTK or KDE does, I can pass the buck as, as the next guy. Um, if you look at what GTK does, it's reading all of your gconf files, which is about three or 400 separate XML files in your configuration, and it reads a bazillion icon files, it reads a million font files. Um, it, it takes, it, 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 takes the disk head and basically buckshots the entire hard disk because it finds files all over the file system. So really at this point, uh, X login is completely seek limited. Um, I don't know exactly what the desktop environments are gonna do. It's really nice to have your, just your uh, configuration spread all over like that because it makes configuring the system very robust because you, you have configuration for each application in a separate file and for practically for every config variable, it's in a separate file. So it's a very robust environment, but it means it's very slow to log in. Um, there was one question about GDM sleeping. Um, when I wrote XDM, I actually changed the X server so that it would send a signal to, G to, the, uh, to the display manager. 
Um, so if you ignore the appropriate signal, uh, tell the X server that the it signal is ignored, it will actually kill with that signal its parent process. So GDM can actually <laughs> synchronously wait for the X server to, come, to become ready. I don't, I assumed it did that. <laughs> That's certainly been, been in, the, uh, in the XDM code base since about, oh, 1990. So, uh, but yeah, X session login just takes a long time because GNOME and KDE read a lot of files. Um, is this a question to the, well, let, let, let me continue on, on what, what Keith's saying. Um, <laughs> if you uh, have been watching Federico uh, Mina uh, Quintero's blog, you will note that, that replacing the GNOME session program with a shell script uh, sped things up like six, six seconds. GNOME session is, has been sped up somewhat in the latest release, but they still have stupidity inside of GNOME session. Um, as far as some of the icon stuff, I believe that there's been some patches for GTK that are, may have already gone in, at least in some distributions, for, for putting a lot of the icons and the like in, um, in a shared memory area so that you aren't at least reading it for each application. So certainly, um, certainly I know the GNOME folks are working pretty hard to try to help this situation, um, but there's just, you know, there's lots more to be done um, in all of this. Um, Jocelyn Mouet comments that um, uh, the, the, the file reading has been changed in GNOME 2.12 and Debian. GConf has apparently received loads of optimizations and as for GNOME session, it is being rewritten. Um, Petra Reynolds comments <coughs> that read ahead and preload might improve the problem with reading files all over the disk. Uh, yes. Uh, was the is the GConf and GNOME session maintainer, so. Hello. Okay, so uh, I wanted to use read ahead too, but uh, I read a lot of documentation and couldn't get it working, but on this moment, when the CPU is being used so much, but the disk is mainly idle, you could use read ahead, so that around this time, when the disk is being used so much, it does not clog the CPU. It will probably take some seconds away, but it needs to be simplified so that it can be done easily. Was there another comment? Yeah, um, uh, about uh, yeah. Hi, about the uh, the dash. I've never used dash, but it uh, seems like a trade-off for increasing boot time. But then you lose uh, flexibility and features from the the uh, the base system. I mean, if um, if during the install, if you use dash, then the user accounts are populated with dash. Then, and it sort of sets a precedence for for the, uh, the base system then. I don't think you need to necessarily change the default user shell, but it's a question of what's actually in essential and what the scripts are using. So certainly for an embedded system, we'd like it if there wasn't bash there as a requirement, but then we're not expecting the user to be sitting there at a shell playing around. So sure, on a desktop system, if you're expecting people to drop into the shell and, and do stuff themselves, maybe want to make sure that bash is installed by default, but that doesn't mean it needs to be an essential. Uh, yeah. I'm Murray. Uh, actually, well, I've got the mic. Um, it's Wookie again. Uh, somebody mentioned over there that there is a problem with uh, stuff at build time requiring essential features of bash, which are complicated and fancy, um, but we don't care about that at all during boot time. Um, that is a general problem that at the moment Debian, because everything's done natively, has no concept of the difference between um, things you need when you're building versus things you need when you're running. And uh, it actually, we probably need to make a distinction between those to solve a great pile of problems. Um, but that's, that's another big subject, which we probably don't want to get into right now, but um, that needs doing. Okay, no more comments? Hi, 
I'm Matt Taggart, and one of the things I do is uh, work on the Linux standard based project, so I can comment a little bit on the LSB uh, file format. Uh, the LSB is a uh, developer standard, and, and what the LSB workgroup was facing when they came up with uh, the standard for init scripts is the fact that um, they were trying to come up with something that could be common across all the Linux distributions so that developers um, writing um, applications and needing to install init scripts could do it in a, a common way across all Linux distributions because you have some Linux distributions that are using System 5 init scripts, you have others that are using other parallel init schemes, um, and then you also have different utilities. You know, in Debian we have um, uh, update rc.d, but in, in Red Hat you have different things, and so uh, we needed one common way for people to be able to um, install an init script on the system and then be sure that it would, would work with System 5 or other things. So the way it works is that um, as an application developer, if you're putting something on the system, you use uh, the LSB um, mandates that LSB compliant uh, runtimes provide a command um, to install the init script and it's up to the uh, Linux distribution to figure out, to, to provide that command and figure out what it does. So in our case, um, it's just a wrapper around um, update rc.d, but you know Red Hat probably does something else because I think they use check config or something like that. Um, so you, you, ha you use this utility to install the init script and then the init script itself um, at the very top in, uh, in some comments, um, there's some syntax that you use to tell it um, you know, not system five numbers about what order I want it started in, you just say what your dependencies are. So you set up these, these comment fields um, that can be parsed later on uh, by the init program or, or like you were saying, if you could have all this stuff pre-compiled ahead of time so it didn't have to be recomputed on boot, which also takes time, you could do that. Um, so if you maintain a package that uses init scripts, uh, take a look at the standard and basically, you know, even though in Debian we're still using system five and um, update rc.d, you can put these comments in there and it will mean in, uh, in the future people will be able to uh, turn on parallel init systems and, and really speed things up a lot. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Philip Hans. I've recently been looking at uh, packaging uh, an alternative init called Depinit, which uh, doesn't use the standard init scripts at all, and you specify dependencies between every service and every, you can depend on things like the existence of a root file system and the rest of it. Uh, and you start the system by instead of saying init3, you say Depinit GDM, and uh, it just does it. Uh, it because it makes completely different assumptions from init throughout. Uh, I can't see it being a, a candidate for edge, really. <laughs> um, but there will be interesting uh, cross-pollination issues between what you're doing and uh, getting this working, so we should have a chat at some time. Uh, do you have any idea of how long it takes to boot? I've seen it boot a system, but it's not a Debian system. It was a Linux from scratch system, and it booted in about 15 seconds. But it's quite a fast machine. That was to a GDM uh, <laughs> login prompt. Yeah, well, it's it's difficult to compare from a Linux yeah. from scratch, but I know. it's a nice the person number. that uh, <laughs> the person that built that uh, is the person that wrote Depinit, and uh, he has a, a very different way of looking at things. So <laughs> a lot of his assumptions will never work in Debian, but some of them are very interesting. No more comments? I'm done.